Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club World Affairs program. My name is Guy Marzarati, correspondent for KQED's California Politics and Government Desk. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Rick Hassan, professor of law and political science at the University of California, Los Angeles, and author of A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. Rick is a leading election law expert and director of UCLA Law's Safeguarding Democracy Project, You've probably seen him on CNN, on MSNBC, and in his new book, A Real Right to Vote, Rick meticulously lays out the history of voter suppression and offers a case for a constitutional amendment to protect our right to vote. Really looking forward to our conversation this evening. Rick, thanks so much uh, for being here. Oh, it's great to be with you, and thanks to the Commonwealth Club for putting this all together. Well, I want to start off talking about the 15th and 19th Amendments what we think of, I think, as our kind of constitutional bedrocks for voting rights. So I think it might be a good place to start uh, this conversation talking about what those actually protect, and maybe more importantly, in this context, what they don't protect when it comes to voting. Sure. And I think it's actually easier for people who are not steeped in constitutional law to understand with a couple of stories. So back in 1874, there was a woman named Virginia Minor. She was an adult citizen, a white woman living in Missouri. And she went to the Supreme Court and she said, you know, we just um, had the country ratify the 14th Amendment. It guarantees the privileges or immunities of citizenship. I'm a citizen, but Missouri's not letting me vote because I'm a woman. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, it's true you're a citizen, but voting is not a right protected uh, in this part of the Constitution. Uh, this is not something that is up to the federal government, it's up to the states. And so uh, Minor and other women who had been trying before uh, this lawsuit was brought to get the right to vote were told by the court that it wasn't already in the Constitution. And so it took another 40 something years until we got to 1920 when the um, Congress passed and the states ratified the 19th Amendment, which says doesn't guarantee a right to vote to anybody. It just says if you're going to hold an election, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. But any, an even worse story is uh, the story of Jackson Giles. It's a 1903 case. Uh, he went to the Supreme Court and said, he said, I'm an adult. I'm a citizen. I'm a resident of Alabama. Alabama is not letting me register to vote because I'm black. And the 15th Amendment, which was one of those other amendments that was passed in the wake of the Civil War, says no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. And the Supreme Court said, yes, it's true. You're a citizen, you're an adult, you're a male. Uh, you are um, entitled to vote under the Constitution, but there's really nothing we can do to, uh, to Alabama. And so we really can't enforce your right to vote. And it was that was 1903, decades after the passage of the 15th Amendment that said no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. And it was not until the 1965 Voting Rights Act when you started seeing large scale registration and voting by African-Americans in the South. So uh, these are parts of the Constitution. They're framed in the negative, and they haven't always even been enforced by the uh, the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, and we can talk a little bit about the history of, of the way in which the court uh, interpreted those laws. But looking at our current election landscape, what are ways in which you see that framing of voting rights in the negative maybe falling short to actually protect equitable access to the ballot. Right. So, uh, you know, if you if you look in the Constitution and say, where is my right to vote? What you find are anti-discrimination provisions. And so uh, what happens when a state passes a law that makes it harder for some people to register or to vote? They have to go to court and they have to find some legal basis. And because our constitution doesn't look like the constitution of other advanced democracies like Canada or Germany that put in it an ex explicit right to vote, most of the constitutional cases that are brought are cases under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And those are cases. So, for example, again, to make this a little more concrete, one of the stories I tell involves uh, Native American uh, voters in North Dakota. These are voters who um, uh, had been uh, voting for years without a problem uh, in state elections, uh, and they had been very important in helping to reelect U.S. Senator Heidi Heitkamp, who was a Democrat. Uh, 
The last time Heidkamp ran for office was a very close election. And Republicans in the legislature passed a new law that said, if you want to vote in uh, the state, you have to produce a residential street address. Now, for you or me, that's not a big deal. You know, we get mail delivered to our residential street address. And for most people in North Dakota, that's not a big deal. What was this law aimed at? This law was aimed at people who are Native Americans who were living on reservations that were so poor that they didn't develop streets with street addresses. Mail would just be delivered to a general area. And so these people were effectively disenfranchised by this law. And they had to fight, I, I chronicle, I think, three lawsuits over six and a half years before the state finally settled and said, OK, we're going to find a way so we don't disenfranchise uh, these voters. Uh, you know, it took thousands of lawyer hours, probably millions of dollars to try to get a basic right that should already be in the Constitution. So what does it mean that we don't have? a right to vote, an affirmative right to vote in our constitution. It means that when there are laws that are put in place, sometimes in the name of preventing fraud, sometimes in the name of promoting voter confidence or efficiency, some of those laws are actually necessary, but some of them are not. And you have to sue and it uh, it, it becomes a constant battle. And it becomes resources, resources end up getting devoted to these kinds of lawsuits that could instead be put into registering voters or into getting out the vote or into educating people about the issues in elections. Instead, we're fighting over the very basic question of hurdles in front of people who want to register or vote. And as you lay out, those hurdles are not uh, new, but neither is the idea of having a real or affirmative right to vote in the Constitution. You lay out ways in which this has been discussed uh, for decades in Congress, one Congress member in 1959, you quote, is saying only those who do not believe in America can possibly object to this amendment. So what happened? Well, it actually goes back. If I mentioned earlier, the 15th Amendment passed after the Civil War. There were some early proposals for the uh, 15th Amendment that was going to have a universal right to vote in it. And this pops up every so often. Uh, in the, at the beginning of the 1960s, pops up again after the 2000 election when we had the debacle in Florida. We realized our voting systems were really antiquated and we're not up to the task of actually counting votes. Uh, what happened in the 1960s, actually, I think, is that the 1960s was a period where there was a lot of movement to further voting rights. So what happened in the 1960s? You got the um, 23rd Amendment, which gave people who lived in Washington, D.C., the right to vote for president. You got the 24th Amendment, which barred poll taxes in federal elections. You got the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You got the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And then if we just go a little bit past uh, 1965, 1971, you got the 26th Amendment, which is the one that says you can't discriminate in voting on the basis of age between 18 and 21. These were for soldiers, essentially, who were going off to fight in the Vietnam War, but who couldn't choose the commander in chief. They weren't allowed to vote. Um, so I think the reason it didn't take off in the 1960s is because there were other ways that voting rights were expanded. And, and I should mention, the 1960s were the one period of time in the 235 year history of the Supreme Court where the court was actually very protective of voting rights and expanded voting rights. This is the so-called Warren Court era. And today, you know, it, what gives us a lot of our protection for voting is not the language in the Constitution, but the kind of pro-voter interpretation that those judges, those justices went through in the 1960s. And those are precedents that may not last before the current Supreme Court, which is a very different court. So the 1960s, I think, is maybe a positive story that there was so much progress on voting rights, it wasn't seen as necessary. But, you know, things ebb and flow. It's not as though we're inexorably moving towards greater voting rights. It, it, it comes and goes. And now we're in a period of heavy polarization, a lot of legislation over voting in red states and blue states, and a lot of litigation over those new laws. Yeah, I get the sense from, from reading this book that maybe our collective faith in the current election law uh, paradigm and maybe the, the lack of, of collective will to change things comes from uh, the experiences of the Warren Court. And I don't know, is it fair to say even Congress may have been kind of lulled into complacency by the fact that, oh, you know, this is an issue that the courts are on the right side of? Well, I do think there was a period uh, uh, when, you know, you think about the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, that was very hard fought. But then by the time we get to the 1980s, when Congress amends the Voting Rights Act and strengthens it by adding 
what's currently now Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. That's a provision that applies nationwide and that uh, allowed for the creation of many districts where minority voters could elect representatives of their choice. These were these laws were initially supported on a broad bipartisan basis, Democrats and Republicans. Over time, from go from the 1970s, 1980s to today, the parties have become much more differentiated from each other. And as, um, for example, African-American voters have gravitated towards the Democratic Party, and as white conservatives have moved from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, you get the separation of the parties, and there's no longer that kind of consensus over broad voting rights. In fact, you know, a lot of Republicans will see the Voting Rights Act not as protecting you know, Black or Latino or Native American voters, but instead as protecting the Democratic Party. Because there's so much overlap between uh, the race of people and the political party they belong to, especially in the South. And so what should be a kind of nonpartisan, no brainer, let's all we should all have an equal right to vote has become mired in partisan politics like everything else in this country. So in, in some ways, that's not a surprise as the parties have really differentiated themselves from each other. And it seems like in the Shelby decision, the the overturning of of preclearance, maybe was the shockwave that okay, we are in a new era when it comes to how this you know how these laws get decided and at the highest judicial levels. And I'm glad you mentioned the Shelby County case. So back in 1965, the Supreme Court, uh, well actually 1965, Congress passed the initial Voting Rights Act. In 1966, the Supreme Court said this was a permissible exercise of Congress's power. So in almost all of these voting amendments, there's a part, an enforcement part, like in the 15th Amendment uh, in, the, in the second clause, it says Congress has the power to enforce uh, this provision by appropriate legislation. And so Congress said that those states and localities with a history of racial discrimination in voting couldn't change their voting rules without getting approval from the, the federal government. And, and they'd have to show that they wouldn't make minority, these changes wouldn't make minority voters worse off. This is the so-called preclearance provision. And the Supreme Court upheld it not just in 1966, but again in the 1980s, it had been repeatedly upheld. But uh, after Congress uh, amended the Voting Rights Act again in 2006 and kept the same coverage formula in place using the same data uh, that went from the 1960s to the 1970s, the Supreme Court, which is much more conservative than it was when it first upheld the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court said this was not a permissible exercise of Congress's power. And so this is a really important point. And it's one that I think a lot of people don't focus on. It's really been Congress that has been the driver of the expansion of voting rights. All of those amendments that we talked about, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, the 26th Amendment, they all were proposed in Congress, had to get two thirds votes in Congress before they're sent to the states for ratification where the states have to, three quarters of the states have to approve them. So Congress has been the leader on voting rights and sometimes it acts by, pass, by, um, ratif uh, by passing amendments that could then be ratified. Uh, and sometimes uh, they act uh, by, uh, passing legislation under the powers given to them. And that's what the Voting Rights Act was. When the Roberts Court in 2013 decided that Congress had now exceeded its powers, it was really sending a message to Congress that you, you know, you're, you're gonna have to um, hew really tightly to uh, our view of federalism and protecting the rights of states if you're gonna pass any legislation that's going to affect the rules for voting. Uh, even today, just uh, you know, in this last year, uh, in a case called Allen versus Milligan, Alabama was trying to get Section 2, another key part of the Voting Rights Act, struck down on constitutional grounds. And there were a number of justices who were interested, not a majority, but one of the justices in the majority, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, said there might be a good constitutional argument against Section 2, and maybe that should be considered in a future case. So we shouldn't think that the remaining parts of the Voting Rights Act are necessarily safe before this court. And how would you characterize the effects of the Shelby decision now a decade on? Well, you know, it's sometimes hard to measure effects because um, think about the question of voter turnout. Why do voters turn out to vote? You know, some people think, well, you know, we, we, we need to, um, you know, make voting mandatory, force people to vote, which they do in some other countries. And that's not how we do it here. What tends to get turnout up more than anything else 
is um, when there's a competitive election. So with Biden and Trump, people are very animated. They, they care about the outcome of elections. They turn out to vote more. But the, the biggest impediment to voting in the United States is registration. Uh, people who are not registered to vote in time, and you know, California has same-day voter registration, but most places don't, uh, they they're end up getting shut out. And you know, who is not registered? Well, you know, it tends to be people who are poor. Uh, it tends to be people who move a lot. It tends to be students. It tends to be racial minorities. And what we've seen in the period since Shelby County is the turnout uh, among uh, uh, minority voters is uh, that the gap between white voters and minority voters is growing. There's just a, a, a big report issued uh, about a week ago by the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School, which found this turnout gap is growing and trying to do a little social science and control for other factors. Uh, the, they, they believe that a big part of this is attributable to what happened after Shelby County, which is that these jurisdictions that used to be covered under this part, part of the Voting Rights Act are no longer covered and they can now pass new legislation, which can have the effect of deterring turnout. I, I just make one other point here. Um, some people are concerned about these restrictive voting rules because maybe they affect the outcome of elections. You know, maybe they help Republicans or help Democrats. And I try to make a more fundamental point in my book, even if you can't prove that they they affect um, you know, who wins elections, uh, even if they have a negligible effect on turnout, there are still voters who are being who are eligible to vote, who are being disenfranchised for no good reason. If we're going to treat ourselves as political equals, and we're going to uh, say that uh, um, we're going to have a democracy where everyone has roughly equal political power, then the state should really have to justify why it's making harder for some, making it harder for some people to register or to vote. If the state has a good reason for imposing a law, uh, then we've got to figure out how to balance those interests. But lots of times. The courts say states don't really have to come up with uh, 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 any evidence to support their reasons. They could say we're trying to prevent fraud or we're trying to have an efficient election system. And that tends to be good enough. That uh, undermines the dignity of each voter. Uh, you know, unless the state has a good reason, it shouldn't be able to easily put extra hurdles in front of voters. Yeah, I want to get into your proposal for a constitutional amendment, but that phrase, uh, political equality, it seems like that's kind of at the center of that principle is at the center of, you know, what you're putting forward in this book. Right. I think, you know, uh, if you look back over American history, there are really two different conceptions of what voting is all about. One is the idea that voting, and it's, that's the one that I subscribe to, and it's the one I think is reflected in the Warren court cases, is that voting is about the allocating of power among political equals. And if that's the rule, then you can't have these extra impediments in front of people. Everyone who's eligible should be able to easily cast a vote. That will be fairly counted. But the other conception of voting is that voting is about making the best choice, right? We need to pick our leaders. And so who should pick our leaders? Well, who's the most qualified? Maybe that's somebody who reads English. Maybe that's someone who owns property. I mean, there were all kinds of restrictions that had been put on voting over the course of American history. And many of them were justified on grounds that some people were less qualified than others to be able to cast a ballot. There, That theory still has a fair number of adherents in this country. And I, I point back to the, the beginning of the Warren Court era. In 1962, uh, a man named Herbert Carrington who was a sergeant in the United States Army. He had to go to the Supreme Court. He was disenfranchised by the state of Texas. He had moved from Alabama to El Paso, Texas, because he had been stationed in nearby White Sands, New Mexico. And he went to vote in the Republican primary. And he was told that under the Texas Constitution, that he did not have the right to vote because he was in the military. Kind of hard to imagine today that Texas would be disenfranchising military voters, but that's what they were doing then. And one of the arguments that Texas made, and it ties directly into your question, uh, one of the arguments that Texas made as to why it was uh, disenfranchising military voters was if we allow military voters on military basis to vote, their votes could swamp the votes of longtime residents and it could affect the outcome of elections. Well, to me, that's a feature, not a bug of democracy. That is, if you let people vote, it might change the outcome of elections. And the Warren Court said, you can't fence people out because of how they might vote. But I think that's what's going on in a lot of these attempts 
to pass these uh, restrictive voting laws. It's we want to shape the electorate. We don't want these people, whoever these people are, voting in our elections, our elections. We are here first. We have those rights. So, you know, that kind of understanding of what voting is for is the antithesis of political equality. It says that some people are more worthy than others to be able to decide you know, who our leaders are going to be or in California, whether we're going to directly pass legislation through the initiative process. And you detail, you know, this happening in more modern times on, on college campuses. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in um, one of the chapters, I talk about uh, the fight again in Texas. Uh, I tell my students I could teach a whole election law course just with cases from Texas. Uh, Texas um, uh, in Waller County, Texas, there's a historically black college called Prairie View A&M University. And basically I talk about three generations of uh, mostly black students who have faced local registrars who have put barriers in front of registration saying, you need to, if you wanna register, initially they said, if you wanna register to vote here, you've got to have parents who live in the area or you have to have a spouse who's working in the area. Being a student isn't enough to establish residency. And those students had to go again all the way to the Supreme Court to get that struck down. And then even over the years, there were questionnaires that were put out. Uh, the latest allegations um, were that uh, uh, early voting opportunities were uh, easier in places that were not near college students. And so we have these, these fights that seem like they're in... Uh, you know, the distant past, they're not all in the distant past. Some of them are going on today. Now, it's, of course, different today because today, you know, nobody says, you know, people of this race or people of this group are disenfranchised. Um, but we see barriers put in front. And I should put a little asterisk there. We do say that about some American citizens, and I talk about them in the book, too, which are people who live in U.S. territories, people who live in Puerto Rico and Guam, uh, American Samoa. These are people, uh, Washington, D.C., when it comes to House of Representatives. Uh, aside from Samoa, they are all considered American citizens. If they move to the mainland, they can vote. They move back to their uh, the U.S. territory. They can't vote anymore. You know, American Samoans, it's even worse. They're considered U.S. nationals. They move to the mainland. They are not even allowed to vote, uh, you know, if they're living in California for a long time. So we've got, uh, you know, some really weird non-universal voting rules in this country. And again, you look around the world in other countries, this is not, the other advanced democracies, this is not how things go. Everyone who is eligible is automatically registered to vote by the government. They're identified by the government, so you don't have to worry about fraud. And they come in and they, uh, you know, it's all about who's going to turn out to vote. It's not about, uh, you know, what are the rules going to be, the hurdles in order to be able to register and to be able to cast a ballot. Right. I mean, you think about how much time campaigns in the United States spend on that, just that initial piece, registering kind of that mobilization before they start making the, the more uh, traditional you know, political arguments. So I wonder, you know, you break this amendment into six pieces, if you can kind of just run through uh, those those six different sections, the idea that you're putting forward for this affirmative right to vote. Sure. So, you know, the, the idea is that um, I should say before I go through the six parts, um, People are fighting over voting rights, but they're fighting this election, this election only. And they're thinking small term. I mentioned the 26th Amendment. That's the one that in, uh, said no discrimination against 18 to 20 year olds. That was it passed in 1971. The majority of Americans today were not even born in 1971. And so, you know, to even talk about a constitutional amendment sounds totally weird. And I'm sure we'll get into, you know, how is this even going to ever happen? But the idea is let's take all of our concerns about voting and put them in an amendment that so that we can, you know, make some progress and so that we're not having these fights of re-election about what the rules are going to be. So the basic idea is to have everyone have the right to vote uh, where they live for the offices that they would be eligible for. That includes the president. Uh, kind of a funny little thing about the Constitution. Doesn't give anyone the right to vote for president. As recently as 2000, the Supreme Court and the Bush versus Gore case that ended the disputed 2000 election said that state legislatures could take back in future elections their power to um, choose electors directly. So we only have the right to vote 
here in California because the California legislature hasn't taken back that right through some legislation, uh, you know, have to be signed by the governor. I mean, that's kind of crazy. So we'll just establish a right to vote and a right to equally weighted votes, which is another thing. You know, one point earlier in California history for the state Senate, every county had equal representation in the state Senate. Los Angeles County and Mono County and Imperial County and Alameda County, these are not the same in terms of population, yet they were all given the same amount of power, right? So aside from the U.S. Senate and the Electoral College, we now use this one person, one vote, this equally weighted voting idea. But I don't trust this current Supreme Court, so I want to put it in the Constitution. I want to say things about the burdens that voters face and to put a thumb on the scale when these cases come to court to favor the voters over the states. Uh, I also want to um, enshrine in the Constitution that part of the Voting Rights Act Section 2 that we talked about that assures that minority voters can have um, equal opportunity to participate in the political process and to elect representatives of their choice. And finally, I want to put a thumb on the scale favoring Congress's enfranchisement that the courts have to defer. So if you actually read my amendment, which is in the appendix in the back of a real right to vote, it looks different than the earlier constitutional amendments on voting, which were very simple and very general. What I think we can learn about American history, that the Supreme Court is pretty um, stingy when it comes to reading voting rights in the Constitution. So I was much more explicit and much more directive about what the courts are allowed to do. And so it really is meant to limit the power of courts to uh, interfere with an expansion of voting rights that would come in this constitutional amendment. Now, the part I'm a little hung up on is the, you know, adding uh, language, making voting not burdensome or not unduly burdensome uh, voting opportunities, because we see voting laws really run the gamut state to state. And I wonder how you would see that kind of language play out into the future. Ballot harvesting, for example, in California is very controversial. Having someone else return your ballot um, would limits on that be uh, burdensome. I can imagine future debates about online voting. Does that become, you know, uh, too burdensome if, if you're restricting online voting? How do you see that playing out specifically? Because I do think you you make a good point in the ways in which the litigation has exploded around voting. How, how do you know, is this just another avenue for that? Oh, that's really a great question. So already we have lots of lawsuits where people come in and they say, this law is too burdensome. And the state comes in and says, well, we have a, 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 an important government interest in this law and the courts have to decide, it, can this law go forward? So we already have that structure. Um, what I would do is kind of flip the, the burden of proof in terms of how these cases get decided. So let's take the question of, I'll call it third party collection of ballots as opposed to ballot harvesting, which is a more of a pejorative term. Agricultural uh, term. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so what is this about? So uh, just to back up for a second, uh, my, my view, having studied this for 30 years, is that voter fraud is a, is a very small problem in the United States. When it does happen, it tends to happen in smaller elections and it tends to happen with mail-in ballots. And that's because those ballots are outside the control of um, election officials. Um we saw a scandal in 2018 in North Carolina where ballots were being collected and destroyed and altered uh, in an effort to help a Republican candidate win a primary. There was so much interference in that election that the North Carolina Board of Elections threw the election results out and had to call another election. Well, that, that's really a, 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 an unusual thing to happen in modern times. So if a state passes a law that says no ballot collection, or take the case of Colorado, they say someone can collect 15 ballots. California, it's unlimited. But let's say a state says no ballot collection. Would that be overly burdensome? So it, first of all, it would depend on what the other voting opportunities are. Are there ample ways that people can get to mailboxes to return their ballots themselves? Are there ample ways for people to vote in person? Right. So if for most people, it wouldn't be a big burden. I don't think that it would be even under my amendment unconstitutional to limit the collection of these ballots. But, and we know this from a case that the Supreme Court decided a couple of years ago called Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee. For uh, some voters who are Native Americans living on reservations, 
where it may be a hundred, literally a hundred miles to the mailbox, uh, ballot a, a limit on ballot collection could be unconstitutional. There's no regular mail service. There's no in-person polling place. And when you're dealing with vast distances and poor people, for them, it could be a big burden. And although the court in the Brnovich case rejected a Voting Rights Act challenge to Arizona's ban on uh, un unlimited ballot collection, I think the right thing to do would have been to say that these voters who face special burdens, they should be allowed to have their ballots collected. So, the, and the language that I put in my proposed amendment would put a thumb on the scale and say, if you really can show that people are being burdened, and I think there was a strong record that not most people in Arizona, but this small group of people with a discrete set of problems, uh, then the state should actually have to come forward with evidence that they need this law to prevent fraud or promote uh, integrity. And maybe there are other ways that the state could try to solve it. For example, proactively putting mailboxes in, proactively the sending government officials to go around collect the ballots. I mean, there may be other ways to deal with this, but we need to kind of, since we're already doing the balancing, we need to ask, are we gonna make the state have to produce evidence to support its reasons for burdening voters? Because right now, the way the Supreme Court has structured that balancing, it puts a thumb on the scale favoring the states, not for favoring like voter voters. ID. What's that? For things in voter ID, for example, very little burden of proof, it seems. Very little burden of proof on that, but also, you know, for most people, producing an ID is not a big deal. So what we need to do is focus on the people for whom it is a big deal. And we need to ask, you know, what can we do to enfranchise these people while still having a system that has integrity? So one of the parts of my amendment would uh, couple automatic voter registration the government would go out and register everybody and pay all the costs associated with figuring out if people are eligible, like getting their birth certificates and all of that, and create a unique identity number that would follow people around throughout their entire um, lives. So if you live in California and then you decide to move to Nevada, that number is going to go with you. And this will be a way to assure that you are not voting in two different places. There are things we can do. How do I know? Because just about every other advanced democracy is able to do this. They don't have to, people don't have to go through all of this uh, difficult process on their own to register to vote. And people are easily identified. So we have a decentralized partisan election administration. We don't run one election for president. We run something like 8,800 elections for president at the same time. Different rules, uh, different burdens that voters face. It's just not a rational system that anybody would design today if they were trying to design an efficient and fair system. But it's the one we've got. And it, in my amendment, because I don't expect we're going to move to national nonpartisan administration of our elections, I ask, how can we take the current system we have and make it fairer and make it better so that it both provides greater voter access, but also assures people that votes are going to be fairly and accurately counted and ineligible people are not going to be participating in our elections. I mean, we see that in California now as political reporters were watching the votes come in every day from all the different counties. And we know oh, this county, you know, they they process ballots very quickly. This one doesn't, you know, uh, those kind of things that I think we just find baked into our system that are odd uh, on their face. So lay out what you see as the procedural path uh, towards ratification for this amendment. Here in California, Governor Gavin Newsom got a lot of blowback uh, last year when he proposed a constitutional amendment on gun safety that would have, you know, put forward a new constitutional convention. There was a lot of critics who said, now, once you do that, you kind of open up debate to a whole host of issues. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that and what you see as the path forward for this amendment uh, uh, on the right to vote? Yeah. So just to give a little background, there are two ways that the Constitution can be amended. The way it's always been amended so far is that Congress uh, passes an amendment by a two thirds vote in each chamber. So the House has to vote and the Senate has to vote for the same thing, has to pass two thirds vote. Then it goes to the states and three quarters of state legislatures have to ratify. The other way is holding a convention. And the rules for how a convention would work uh, are, are not spelled out well in the constitution. The idea is that people would meet in different states, they would come up with different ideas uh, for um, 
uh, what they'd want to see in a constitution. There would at some point be a national uh, meeting. And then these, uh, how and we don't know exactly how this is supposed to happen, but then there would be a set of amendments and those two would have to be supported by three quarters of the state legislatures. And so one of the worries, I think, especially on the left now, is if we held one of these conventions, even if it was, you know, Governor Newsom wants it to be about gun safety. It, you know, maybe it's going to be about abortion and in vitro fertilization. Maybe it's going to be about immigration. Who knows what it's going to be? I guess I'm less worried about that because you still need to get three quarters of the states to agree. That's a lot of states in a country that is, you know, fairly evenly divided. So I'm not so worried about the runaway convention. I'm much more worried that we don't know what the procedures are. And you can imagine just kind of interminable fights over whether this is a valid way of trying to amend the Constitution or not. So I want it the old fashioned way. Uh, let Congress pass this thing. Now, I think, you know, a more kind of direct question on this is, well, how can you expect a Congress that can't even pass voting rights legislation? The Democrats just this week reintroduced the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to try to fix some parts of the Voting Rights Act that the Supreme Court has messed with. Can't get that passed. Right? How are you going to pass a constitutional amendment? And so my answer to this is uh, twofold. First, uh, we have to think about a longer time horizon. Uh, if you think about, I told you the case at the beginning uh, of our discussion, I told you about the case of Virginia Minor and how she lost at the Supreme Court. That was 1874. It took four decades of organizing in order to get to the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And along the way, and this is my second point about why it's good to have an amendment, it paid political dividends. So by the time you get to the 19th Amendment in the Constitution in 1920, 30 states had amended their state constitutions to prevent discrimination in voting on the basis of gender. And so what a uh, right to vote amendment movement would do is it would galvanize public concern about voting in a very tangible way and give people an agenda of things to fight for. Maybe they're going to fight for that first in their states and then move from the states to the national system. So by the time we get to a um, serious, a, a point of serious consideration of the amendment, many states would have already reached this point to amend the Constitution. And I'll make one more point here, which is the Democratic versus Republican split. First of all, there's a lot in this for Republicans in terms of voter ID, in terms of election integrity, in terms of a rational system for running elections. But also, I think we all uh, have noticed that the um, composition of the Republican and Democratic Party is changing. Uh, with Donald Trump as the head of the Republican Party, there are many more poor, uh, uh, less educated um, voters who are voting uh, for Republicans. Those are people who are much more likely to be disenfranchised by state voter ID laws or other onerous voting laws. And so it might well be, maybe not now, maybe in five or 10 years, it might well be in the interest of the Republican Party to make voting easier for everybody who's eligible. Maybe we're going to have a moment where the parties will be able to come together on this. I know it's very hard to imagine in our really hot political environment now, the parties coming together on anything, but I've got this book. It, it can sit on a shelf for a long time. When the time comes to pull it off the shelf, there'll be something that people can look at. And I mean, we've certainly seen that, right, in recent elections where high turnout doesn't necessarily spell doom uh, for Republicans up and down the ballot. You mentioned the momentum built in states for previous uh, constitutional amendments. Has there been any progress or momentum around an affirmative right to vote in state constitutions? So every state constitution, I think all but one, have some mention of the right to vote in their constitutions. Part of that is, again, to go back to the original U.S. Constitution, it says who's allowed to vote uh, for elections for the U.S. House of Representatives, whoever is qualified to vote for the larger uh, body of the state legislature. So because of that, every state uh, has rules for who can vote for the state legislature. It's in the California Constitution. It's in every constitution. Um, so these typically spell out what you, you know, you have to be living in the state for a certain number of days and you have to be an adult and like it lists a whole bunch of things, right? You have to be at least 18 years old, whatever those things are. Um, so those, there already are 
kernels of the right to vote in every state constitution. But in terms of more broadly protecting voting rights, most state constitutions have been interpreted to not more broadly protect voting rights than the US Constitution. And so constitutions can be amended. It's as you know, covering California politics, it's so much easier to amend the California Constitution, right? You know, it's the same signature uh, requirements essentially. Uh, you know, like we don't I mean, we don't have a 60 percent vote threshold to get constitutional amendments through. Some states have more, you know, difficult requirements. So we're amending the Constitution all the time. You ever try to read the California Constitution it doesn't read like a constitution. It reads like a whole bunch of <laughs> statutes. Right. It's not like these big lofty principles. It's like a bunch of technical things. So um, the fact that it's easier to amend state constitutions provides an, an in an opening, a way to try to think about. Well, let's strengthen voting rights. And I would add that Michigan is a really good example. Uh, it's a state that had a Republican legislature that was doing some things to make it harder for people to register and vote. And voters were able to pass a set of voter initiatives, amending the state constitution and strengthening voting rights. Now, that's not going to be possible everywhere. That's not going to happen in Texas because Texas doesn't have an initiative process. Uh, but in a lot of places, the initiative is a path where voters can get their say. I mean, look in California, it was Democrats who opposed the creation of the redistricting commissions, right? It was Democrats initially who opposed the top two primary, right? These are both kind of driven by voters. And I don't know if you remember the top two story about Abel Maldonado, like yeah. sneaking it in as part of a budget deal. Um, but, you know, uh, political reform can happen on the state level and sometimes in surprising ways. And if we think about that first state by state, how did we get... To give another voting example, beginning of the 20th century, the 17th Amendment, which provides for the direct election of senators. Until the 20th century, senators were chosen by state legislatures. People didn't vote for senators. Well, there was a movement in the states. There was a movement in the states to only vote for state legislators who would support the passage of a constitutional amendment that would directly um, give votes uh, to the people to vote for the Senate. So things... We've lost our imagination. We don't know this history. And we think it's impossible to amend the Constitution. Let's not even talk about it. it's a non-starter. I also think just as a matter of educating the public, it's like, what do you mean there's no right to vote in the Constitution? Did an event down here in Los Angeles at the Hammer Museum, and they gave out copies of the Constitution. And uh, the person who introduced me said, uh, go find the right to vote in the Constitution. And, you know, it was a trick question because it's not there. Right. But we can put it in state constitutions much more easily. We're going to get to uh, we have a lot of audience questions to get to. But I you know, I'm sure some people might be wondering, Rick, this sounds great as kind of our a 10 year uh, plan to put on our vision board. Can you talk about stuff or work that's being done to protect the next uh, election in 2024, specifically around the Electoral College and maybe just focusing, if you could, on what the last Congress ended up doing around changes to the you know ways in which the electoral college votes are counted well so if you go back to 2020 you remember at the end of 2020 donald trump didn't concede the election and he brought a number of lawsuits claiming that there were fraud and irregularities and those uh lawsuits were all unsuccessful and so then he tried a a political um means to try to reverse his fortunes which was essentially to try to create alternative slates of electors so just to back up for a second, when we vote uh, for president, we don't vote for the president directly, even though it looks like, you know, see the name Trump or Biden or, or uh, RFK Jr. or whoever it's going to be on the ballot. You vote your ballot and you're actually choosing electors. People are going to be, they, they actually, are, they're going to meet, they'll meet in Sacramento here and, and they're going to vote in December of 2024 and they're going to cast their votes. Those votes get sent to Congress and then they get counted. That's what was going on on January 6th when we had the invasion of the Capitol. Now, before January 6th, what Trump was trying to do was to say that because there were irregularities in the election, again, not proven and in fact disproven, because there were these irregularities, state legislatures should come in and they should come up with a different slate of electors. And no state legislature did this, but some le electors met anyway, and they tried to send in alternative slates, and they were trying to manipulate those electoral college rules so that votes would be thrown out for Biden or not counted or create some uncertainty, which could trigger part of the Constitution uh, in the 12th Amendment called a contingent election. Most people probably have not thought about this. 
uh, if nobody gets a majority in the Electoral College, then each state delegation in the House of Representatives gets one vote to choose the president. Uh, kind of a weird system. We haven't had to use this, but you know, this could happen, right? So um, uh, what happened uh, in December of 2022 is that Congress on a bipartisan basis, at least bipartisan in the Senate, it was mostly Democrats in the House, uh, passed what's known as the Electoral Count Reform Act, which changed some of the technical rules for how states send in their electoral college votes and what state legislatures have the power to do, what the vice president has the power to do, and tried to clarify some of those rules. So to make it much harder for us to get a repeat of what happened in 2020. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be potentially attempts to try to overturn the results of a democratic election, but that particular path is going to be much more difficult thanks to the passage of this legislation, as well as thanks to a Supreme Court decision from last June called Moore versus Harper, where the Supreme Court rejected some of the kind of intellectual theories that were behind the idea that state legislatures had sort of unbridled power to choose electors even after the people had voted for president. That independent uh, state legislature theory. Um, let's turn to some audience questions. We have a number of great ones. Uh, can you tell us more about UCLA's Safeguarding Democracy Project? Right. So when I joined UCLA about a year and a half ago, uh, I recognized that uh, our democracy faces uh, some unique challenges now in terms of not only the ability to continue to conduct free and fair elections, but voters' confidence in the fairness of the election process. And so Safeguarding Democracy Project, we, we hold uh, a number of webinars. We're doing one today is Tuesday. We're doing one Thursday on what is business's role in preventing democratic backsliding. Uh, next month, we're doing one on the relationship between uh, race and election subversion. All of these events are free. Uh, almost all of them are streamed online. If you go to safeguardingdemocracyproject.org, you can sign up for these events. You can also sign up for our mailing list. We also put on a conference and we convened a group of experts, 24 experts came up with 24 recommendations for 2024 in the area of um, law, media, politics, and tech. What should everyone be doing? What should Facebook be doing now? What should election administrators be doing? And you could, if you, if you Google 24 for 24 Safeguard Democracy Project, you'll find a copy of that report. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope at one point we'll be able to expand and start filing briefs and cases raising these issues and um, get students more involved in uh, these kinds of issues. But we're, we're kind of a small startup. So webinars, uh, as you know, are pretty cheap to run. So that's what we're doing right now. So that's what the Safeguarding Democracy Project is all about. That's fantastic. A uh, listener asks, you mentioned California offers same day registration to help make voting accessible and available. I'll add universal mail balloting as well. Are there other states that have laws or policies in place that should be adopted to expand voting rights? I guess who's who's doing it well in terms of expanding yeah. opportunities for voting? Well, I should also explain um, that same day voter registration, uh, when you when you go to register to vote on the day of the election, you're not already registered. What you're going to do is you're going to cast what's called a provisional ballot. You're going to cast a ballot that's not they're not going to automatically stick it in the machine and count ballot like you would if you were already eligible. They've got to confirm that you're eligible to vote. So there are safeguards in place. So I think some people have a kind of misunderstanding. Same thing with the kind of uh, automatic vote. I don't like the term, but they, they call it automatic voter registration, where people who go to the DMV will be. Uh, registered to vote if they are eligible. Uh, if um, someone is not eligible, for example, if they're um, not a citizen, they're not going to be registered to vote. You have to have systems in place uh, to do these things. California is pretty good about enfranchising uh, voters. It's pretty good about its election administration. The big complaint about California, uh, you've already uh, uh, mentioned it, it's slow. Uh, one of the things we do is um, we say that as long as your ballot is postmarked by election day, uh, that's good enough. And um, uh, if the ballot arrives, I believe it's within seven days of today. the election. What's that? Today. Today is the, the yeah. last arrival day. I joked, you, you know, I think you'd have to mail it by a horse and carriage, but there well, are. Well, you know, I've mailed some things that still haven't arrived, so you never know. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, a lot of other states uh, that also do elections well. Uh, Arizona, and I was actually Florida uh, after 2000, they really got their act together. They do elections uh, well. They require that 
uh, ballots arrive by election day. And I think so long as people have advanced notice, I don't think that's a really disenfranchising thing. You know, if people know in September that their ballot has to arrive by election day, they'll have plenty of time to mail that ballot back if they want to vote by mail or, or they can drop it off in person at a polling place. Um, uh, one of the things that um, some states do well also is what is called pre-processing of ballots. That's where you do everything but count the votes. You just make sure that the signature matches or whatever has to be verified uh, in order to count a mail-in ballot is done in advance. One of the reasons we saw um, the long lag times in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin the last time around was because they didn't allow this. And this really, in this polarized atmosphere, this is not a good thing. Uh, because, you know, I really have two concerns about our elections. One is about, are we going to be able to run a fair election? And I think we actually did a pretty good job, especially during the pandemic in 2020 and running a, a fair election. But the other is, are people going to believe that the election is fair? And because there's so much conspiracy mongering and disinformation floating out there, people tend to believe the false things. And one of the things that contributes to that is the lag time between the time that people vote and the time that results are final. You may remember the whole question about calling Arizona uh, and whether or not, uh, you know, look, do you have to wait till this many votes are in or that many votes are in? And um, if you can count the ballots more quickly, like there's no good administrative reason to count the ballots more quickly. You know, no one's serving for office immediately. So who cares? Right. But um, for the sake of people not talking about ballot dumps in the middle of the night, you know, we're just like, OK, now Detroit is ready to report its totals because it's finally counted its ballots because it's a big, slow city that takes a lot of time. You know, think about Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County has more ballots to be counted than most. I don't say most than many states. Right. So there's just a ton of ballots to be counted. So we need to make it faster, not because there's something good about fast elections, but because we're in an environment of conspiracy mongering. And this is something we need to be worried about. And we've seen that kind of conspiracy mongering, particularly by former President Trump, literally change voting behavior. I mean, here in California, Republicans used to dominate early mail-in balloting, and now it's completely shifted to where you often see a, a greater push in in-person voting among Republicans on election day for exactly that reason, kind of false fears that ballots are going to be tampered with if they're put in a drop box or, or mailed back. Um, question about the Electoral College. Uh, you talk about it uh, in this book, but this listener wants to know if you have any specific changes that you would recommend um, as part of these reforms you're suggesting. So what I do in A Real Right to Vote is I start with the basic amendment. That's what we've really been talking about, those six different things, the equally weighted votes, the, the, the registration identification rules, the, the, the burden balancing and all of that. But then I have four add-ons, things that depending on what the leaders of a future movement might want, we could also include. And one of those is getting rid of the Electoral College. There have been a number of very good books, including recently, on reforming the Electoral College. So I don't spend a lot of time in my book on it. I, I don't um, support the Electoral College. Uh, I would love to see an amendment to get rid of the Electoral College and move to a national popular vote. Um, but I think that if there's going to be a bipartisan coalition that might support a basic right to vote, I think that might be the deal breaker. So I kind of put it off to the side, along with changing the Senate, enfranchising former felons, and dealing with voting in U.S. territories. Those are all things I would like to see those four expansions, but I'm trying to you know, think about like... What's the bare minimum that we need? And, you know, what would be kind of on a political equality wish list? Um, one thing I don't support, which a number of people who don't like the Electoral College do support, is something called the National Popular Vote Compact. This is something that California is part of. This is an idea that you're going to get an agreement among enough states representing a majority of the Electoral College that they would agree that their state's electors would be pledged not to who wins in the state, but whoever wins the national popular vote. What I don't like about that is that it's kind of like an end run around the Constitution, and I worry it could create some mischiefs. So you can imagine, let's say it's 2024 and it's Biden versus Trump, and it looks like Trump is in the lead in uh, the national popular vote, barely, uh, but not in California. And California has pledged to be part of this compact, as it has, 
California has voted to actually be part of this compact. Well, the compact itself says you can't withdraw within six months of the uh, election. But I don't know that that's enforceable under the Constitution. And so you could easily imagine Governor Newsom saying, you know, we're not going to be part of this. We're not going to help to elect Trump. We're going to pledge our votes if Biden wins to Biden. And then you'd have chaos, right? Because, you know, what are the rules? Are the rules going to be a popular vote or not? So as much as I I personally think that it would be great to get rid of the Electoral College. I think if we're going to do it, we have to do it the right way, which is to amend the Constitution to do it. You do write about some of the you know, potential avenues or maybe leeway that states have in deciding just how to assign their Electoral College votes. Do you see that as perhaps like the next frontier of democratic subversion that we should all be watching in 2024, ways in which the individual state legislatures might decide to, to change the process of allocating those Electoral College votes? So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, in Bush versus Gore, the Supreme Court said the states could take back their power to choose electors directly. I don't think that's going to happen. I think voters would be very upset if they lost their right to vote for president. People don't like to be told that uh, they had a right they no longer have. Um, but you can imagine something similar, but not quite as direct, which is what if a state legislature passes a law that says if there's a dispute over who's won the presidential election, it's not going to court. It's coming to the state legislature to resolve. The state legislature will be the fact finder that will determine the outcome of the election. That could work just as well. And there have been proposals like that. I think there have been two bills like that in Arizona. So far, they haven't gained much traction. But, you know, we're, it's it's not too late. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the things I'm watching for. And I think people are on guard for, you know, what might be paths that people might try to assure that we don't... Uh, you know, people want to assure that we don't have these uh, workarounds. Uh, we want to assure, and this is why I think we need a right to vote. We want to have rules in place to assure that the vote actually reflects the vote of the people. In this case, with the Electoral College, the vote of the people in each state. I think it gets compl even more complicated from gerrymandering, where you end up with these state legislatures that seem even more politically polarized and maybe even more inclined to pursue, uh, you know, those kind of those kind of uh, gimmicks or, or avenues uh, in in electoral politics. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, here's an easy one. Can you talk about the current Supreme Court? Public trust is quite low. What should be done to reinstate public confidence and trust? Well, a lot of that is in the hands of the Supreme Court, and uh, you know, there's not only part of the reason that the Supreme Court's. Um, Popularity or approval is low is because of a number of ethics scandals, scandals especially involving Justice Clarence Thomas. I point out that you know not only were they all, there all of these financial issues related to you know, him getting um, you know, a two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar Winnebago uh, and getting um, uh, tuition paid for uh, a nephew who was like uh, you know. A, being treated like an adopted son, but there were also political issues. So for example, we had the Supreme Court decide this case last week about uh, whether Donald Trump can be disqualified from the ballot. And Justice Thomas's spouse, Ginny Thomas, uh, had been involved in some of the efforts to try to change the election outcomes and Justice Thomas didn't recuse. So I think that the court needs stronger ethics rules. One of the problems that the court faces is that we've always had liberals and conservatives on the court, but now the, at the first point in modern times where all the liberals were appointed by just uh, by presidents of one party, all the conservatives by president of another party. And so we can talk about the Republican majority on the Supreme Court in a way that we couldn't before. And I think that makes the court be seen as more of a political institution. And of course, the number one thing is the court is more of a political institution. In a lot of these important cases, the court is dividing along party lines on issues of voting rights, immigration, abortion, environmental law. And so, you know, it's hard for people to accept the Supreme Court as, a, as somehow above politics when they seem to be dividing in the same way that politicians divide. It makes people wonder what's the line between law and politics. Especially when you have, you know, former President Trump saying, I appointed these members of the court to end up in this specific result on something like abortion rights, it does create that uh, kind of feedback loop. What are you watching at the court, uh, I guess, in the months to come before the election? They might have some pretty big decisions in front of them when it comes to uh, the former president. 
Well, they've got one right now. They're going to hear oral arguments on April 25th. It involves whether uh, a, pres a former president is uh, absolutely immune from criminal liability for any official acts. This is the case, the Washington, D.C. election subversion case that's been put on hold. Uh, the court is likely to decide that by the end of June. They kind of dragged their feet in terms of timing on this case. They had an opportunity to take this case in December and passed on that first opportunity. So one of the things we're watching is not just what the court says about whether or not Trump is immune. And I think the court's likely to say he's not immune, at least not for some of the things he's alleged to have done. But is there going to be enough time to put Trump on trial before the election? And, and right now, I think that's not uh, at all likely. It could happen uh, if the court moves particularly quickly, but it doesn't seem likely. Um, in addition to that case, there's a case involving some January 6th um, uh, invaders of the Capitol who've been charged under a certain federal criminal statute with obstructing an official proceeding. That one is relevant to Trump because he's been charged under the same statute, and we're going to get learn what that means. But then there are a number of cases that are not directly related to Trump, but that could affect the presidential election. We're, you know, we're going to hear major cases on abortion rights. Uh, we're going to hear cases on uh, the power of the administrative state, the so-called Chevron doctrine, but that, that big case pending. Um, there's a case about uh, actually three cases involving social media companies and whether or not they can uh, regulate certain kinds of political content. Uh, it's going to be a blockbuster term. Most of those cases won't be decided until the second half of June, uh, but that's going to take us, you know, it's going to be those cases, and then we're going to get the Republican convention, the Democratic convention, you know, then it's, by, then, by the time you know it, it's Labor Day and early voting. So, you know, it's all going to happen. It's going to be a pretty uh, intense uh, summer. Yes. I think that we're facing. A lot ahead. Uh, well, last question of the night. You've laid out this case for the affirmative uh, right to vote. Have any members of Congress uh, gotten in touch to, to take you up on this proposal? Well, uh, you know, part of my inspiration for writing this was the work of Jamie Raskin, who before he was a member of Congress was an election law professor. So I've known Jamie for a long time. We did an event, a uh, book event in Washington, D.C., and I know he's interested in this. Uh, and I've spoken to some staffers and some other members of Congress. So uh, I don't think it's happening tomorrow, but uh, it'd be nice to see something like this introduced and discussed in Congress. Fantastic. Well, our thanks uh, to Rick Hassan. He's the author of A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Rick's new book at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. That's commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm Guy Marzarati. Thank you again so much for tuning in tonight and take care.